Well, I want to thank our team so much for helping out with all the aspects of our service today. Um, Eva, we're so thankful for your ability to return and uh, provide uh, the leadership of, of, of the, the music. So we'll praise the Lord. And thank you to Nicole and Sarah and uh, Penny for, for leading us today. And, and you know, uh, to Rondi and Nassim and our video team and deacons, I, I've mentioned before, you know, um, it takes a real team every single Sabbath we meet uh, to do the different things that we do. It, uh, and a lot of people do double duties. I mean, um, and Nassim went right from teaching uh, in Sabbath school to helping with children's story, and Eva taught and then come and, and led here. So a lot of people, um, it's not that they just do one or two things. Patsy, you were out greeting this morning for us this morning. Thank you for that. Our deacons. It just takes, it takes everyone, doesn't it? It takes a, it takes a real family um, to enhance and make the worship service as full and joyful as possible. I know we just had uh, our family prayer. I, I like to also have a prayer before I speak, so I'd invite you to bow your heads with me right now as well. God in heaven, Father, we just dedicate this time to you. We, we have sung, we have prayed, we have given of our offerings, and we have uh, just lifted up our hearts to you, Father. And Lord, we continue to do that right now. Speak to us through your word. Bless us this day, Father. Give us your your love and your wisdom, and we will give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so last week I talked about love and action, and this is obviously just a continuation kind of along the same lines of, of the church in action. And um, as Nassim kind of mentioned also during Children's Story, you know, you know, faith without works is dead, and that's really what my focus was last week about if we really love Jesus, um, that should be seen in our actions somehow. But I'm going to get right into the, uh, the kids' quiz this morning, and uh, just raise your hand if you want to help me out. I think I have four questions this morning to get us started here into some of the Bible stories we're going to be looking at here in just a few minutes. Do you remember this story about when Jesus was dedicated at the temple? Who did he... Uh, meet there. There are two special, or well, I guess I could ruin the first one. Uh, there were a couple of special people who happened to be there when Jesus was dedicated. What was their names? And, and Ryan, you had your hand up almost from the very beginning, so you, you're going to help us out. Which one do you say? He says, C, Simeon and Anna. And uh, I guess I got to learn how to use this. That is correct. Uh, so we'll look at that story briefly here in just a few minutes, but uh, uh, this is the only time they're mentioned in the scriptures, but they play a very uh, wonderful role in the, in the life of Jesus and in the life of, of his family, and uh, so that's interesting. Okay, now we're going to go to another story of Jesus. How old was he when he got lost in Jerusalem? Uh, and I put lost in quotes because was Jesus lost? You know, but sometimes that's how it's referred. And I saw Ketsia all the way in the back throw her hand up so fast. So we're going to give her a shot here. She, I heard you too. Thank you for saying it so loud. You are right. The Bible says that Jesus was 12 years old during this story. That's an amazing thing to think about. And uh, again, we'll just look at that story very briefly this morning as, as we get into the message. All right. Now, as Jesus grows up a little bit older, there's another story where he goes into, I call it a church, but it was a synagogue, the same idea of a, a place of worship and assembly. What Old Testament book did Jesus read from when he went to church and said, he's quoting now from the book, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And of course, he quotes more of that, to preach good news to the poor and, and uh, release of the captives. All right, I'm going to give Caleb a chance back there. I'm sorry, Gloria, I'm going to try to mix this up a little bit. What did you say? He said, what, what did you say it one more time? <laughs> okay, thank you. I heard it. Thank you so much, Caleb. And you are right. He quotes from the book of Isaiah. And, and that would have been a, a very interesting time to be in church that day when Jesus stands up and he quotes from the book of Isaiah, don't you think? All right, last one. Another story of Jesus. How did Jesus heal the man with the withered hand? Do you remember this story in your Bibles? Jesus does a lot of miracles, a lot of healings, but there's a particular story where a man has a withered hand. And so, Gloria, I kind of promised I'd come to you on this one. So what do you say? She said, D, 
Yeah, and Jesus does a lot of different things in healings, doesn't he? Sometimes he does spit, right? Uh, sometimes he says, go wash in the pool of Siloam or, or, or something like that. He did, he did touch people at times. Sometimes he would speak. And it's, a, it's an interesting to think about the reasoning behind everything. But in this particular story, and again, we'll look at it briefly, Jesus says, stretch out your hand. Stretch out your hand. And in that act of faith, his uh, hand was restored. So thank you so much to, to the kids that participated. I just had the four uh, questions to get us started this morning. And again, we're going to look at these stories um, just a little bit. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a teacher. Uh, there, there is some correlations between teaching and preaching. Um, and, and biblically, as a matter of fact, they're really quite the same. Jesus was a rabbi, right? He was a teacher. Um, and so we follow in the pattern of teachers. What I'm trying to say is sometimes... Uh, when I think about how I want to convey a message, I don't want to tell it to you too directly. I kind of like to beat around the edges because I want the light bulb to come on in your head on your own, right? I don't necessarily want to just come right out and say, everyone should be baptized, everyone should join the church, everyone should be active, everyone should love Jesus. Now, I believe all that, right? I, do any of you believe that? Three of you do? Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay, no, I believe all that, but if I'm preaching on baptism, I, I don't necessarily come right out and say it that directly. I talk about the need of reform. I talk about the, the peace that comes when Jesus comes into your heart and the decision, you know, you know so I, I kind of come at things a little indirectly, and sometimes I do that too much. And so I, right here at the outset, I want to be very direct, okay? I beat around the edges a little bit, and actually when George preached a couple weeks ago, we, he and I talked about kind of the theme we're going to be going into uh, with nominating committee and the beginning of the year and kind of a time of recommitment, a time of, you know, really um, uh, new starts and things like that. And, and he preached about the different ways uh, or, uh, you know, reasons people come to church, and we want to get to that committed and, and also where we're contributors. And last week I talked about how love is an action. If we really love Jesus, we should be acting on that some way that uh, benefits the gospel ministry and the work. And so today I'm just going to be a little bit even more direct about it and say, I think everybody who loves Jesus and is part of the church should be active in the church. Is that, is that direct enough? Okay, if you love Jesus and you are part of a church, and if you're a visitor here today or maybe you're not kind of in between churches, I understand. I'm just saying you should have an active, visible ministry of some kind in the local church. Some of it's behind the scenes, some of it's up front, some of it's during the week. Not everything is, is going to be the same. Um, um, a, couple, a couple of ways of illustrating this. Um, a pastor friend, this did not happen to me, uh, but a pastor friend told me about a church that he was pastoring. When he first came to the church, the person who ran sound every single week got there an hour early. And he just happened to notice that. He thought, that's it. Before the deacons got there, before the greeters got there, this sound engineer, very much like our friend Robert in the back, you know, I used to try to beat Robert to church. I think I made, managed to do it once. <laughs> He's here first thing, getting all the video equipment, the, the people who are watching from home, and, and a lot, and it's not just Robert, others help along, uh, you know, in ways too, but Robert gets here usually before anyone else, and he's setting up our video cameras, he's helping to get things ready for the streaming and the program, and I'm so thankful because so many people are able to benefit from, from our video ministry and from streaming, and if you're watching right now, but in a very similar fashion, uh, again, this pastor friend just noticed this sound engineer, this is kind of before videoing and streaming your services was, was uh, as uh, popular, uh, always there early, checking the mics, checking the levels, making sure everything was setting up. And he was very impressed by this. So he one day, after a few months being new at the church, or maybe it was even longer, a year, I don't know, he pulled him aside and he said, you know, I'm just very delighted to see your investment in the church. You are one of the first one here. Tell me what it is that makes it so that you want to come like that. And, and, and the, the answer that he gave, and, and I remember the pastor sharing this during a devotional in a pastor meeting, you know, just something that stuck with me forever. He said, well, pastor, it's very simple. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When I come and set up the sound, I realize I am helping the word of God to be heard in this place, and I take it very seriously. Isn't that a beautiful way of looking at it? 
He didn't look at it as a chore. He didn't look at it as a, as a, you know, a duty or anything like that. Well, obviously, he took it very seriously as a responsibility. He saw it as a ministry. He saw it as helping people and helping the church draw closer to Jesus. Now, I'm just going to broaden that and say everything that we do in the church ought to have that kind of perspective, whether you're even doing things like church decorating. How many of you guys enjoyed the Christmas decorations? Didn't that just provide a richness to the service? And just when you came into church, it just kind of shared this thought of the season and of the, the birth of Jesus. I don't know how much Talia put into that, Mrs. Shoup. Ms. Shoup. Um, I know she had help, helpers do that, but what a blessing that was. And again, for our people watching from home, this is a pretty boring thing to see. Now, I don't mean to take that away from, from a, but the white panels and, you know, I, I, I watched TV church a, a couple of times, as my daughter calls it, TV church. Um, and, you know, they only get to see what's behind me, right? And they don't have the benefit of kind of being able to, to look around, the, you know, the, the, the camera's focused. Even something as simple as church decorating enhances the ability of the church to appreciate the goodness of God. And we could go through every single ministry in the church and identify exactly how important it is to the work of the gospel. But I want to share with you one of my favorite um, sections, passages, um, from the spirit of prophecy. This is the very first statement in Acts of the Apostles, very first sentence in the book Acts of the Apostles. And you'll see why I, I, I love it so much. It takes two slides to get it on. But let's just uh, read, read along with me here or just listen as I read. The church, okay, the church is God's appointed agency for the salvation of men. That, again, was last week's ser sermon. It was organized for service. Now, when she says service, she doesn't mean a worship service. She's talking about an active service towards the furtherance of the gospel. What we do here is part of that service, right? But if it stays here, if it's only here, or if it's only a receiving thing that we do, it doesn't fulfill what is being described here. It was organized for action, we might say. And its mission is to carry the gospel from, uh, to the world. From the beginning, and we went all the way back to Genesis last week, remember? All the way back to the Garden of Eden. The very first command that God gave Adam and Eve is grow this family. Be fruitful and multiply. From the beginning, it has been God's plan that through his church shall be reflected to the world his fullness and his sufficiency. The members of the church, those whom he's called out of darkness into his marvelous light, are to show forth his glory. The church is the repository of the riches of the grace of Christ, and through the church will eventually be made manifest, even to the principalities and powers in heavenly places, the final and full display of the love of God. Now, again, the church is not a building. The church is people gathering together with a common goal, right? To learn together, to grow together, to, to be equipped and so that we can be better able to fulfill the Great Commission. But just notice all these things about the purpose and reality and responsibility of everyone who claims to be part of this church. To be a servant somehow, some way, maybe in a traditional sense, maybe in a new sense, but it's something we are all asked to commit to and be committed to. So um, just a couple more verses on this idea of Christ's relationship with the church. Husbands, you, you know this verse uh, from Ephesians. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. The relationship between Jesus and the church is just as intimate as the relationship between a man and his wife. And we are part of that. We are the bride. We are the church. And the Jesus chooses this most, uh, again, intimate and personal uh, uh, analogy to say, I feel about the church the same way I have a love and dedication and loyalty and, and desire for the uplifting of the church just as much as a husband should have for his wife. That's pretty serious stuff, isn't it? 
Colossians, um, Paul says, he, Christ, is also the head of the body, the church. Last week I talked about, you know, sometimes we get frustrated with the church. Sometimes we don't understand the church. Sometimes we're hurt by the church. Sometimes we're very angry with the church. Jesus got angry with the church at times. But it's still his body. It's still his bride. Right? And the challenge before us is how do we embrace that knowledge that it's still his church, it's still his body, it's still his bride, even in the midst of brokenness and the trials of this life. And then from Revelation, just I put all these up here, the whole letter of Revelation is to the church, right here at the beginning, John to the seven churches, and then seven times in the letters of the churches in Revelation 2 and 3, it says, let him who has an ear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. It's all designed to go to the churches. And then here at the end, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. The role and ministry of the church is central. It is not ancillary. It is not secondary. It is primary. The church is the hub through which all other ministry finds its central core and its community and its connection. The church is And again, the church is not just this building. It's not just this congregation. It is uh, other things as well. But we have to have a common core. Now, I'm just going to, uh, and I know four stories and four testimonies seems like a lot. I'm going to do this um, somewhat uh, briefly. I could really develop thoughts on every single one of these. But I just want to take you to four stories of Jesus and then share four little testimonies from my own life. Uh, The stories of Jesus are all going to be in the Gospel of Luke. Okay, and if you remember the kids' quiz and those stories, um, they're, they're going to tie into those. So come with me to Luke chapter 2, if you will. Verses aren't on the screen. If you have it on your phone or you want to look it up in your Bible or if you want to just listen and follow along with me, um, you can do that as well. But Luke chapter 2, the dedication of Jesus Christ at the temple. And again, I could take this whole story, so I'm going to try to uh, keep my thoughts on focus here. We're going to all come all the way to verse 25. Jesus is probably about two months old at this time, okay, because they have completed their period of purification, and they come to uh, Jerusalem. So this is before the wise men have come now, because uh, after the wise men come, Jerusalem and, and Herod is all in an uproar, and they go to Egypt. So, and they're also very poor at this time, so we know they have not received the gifts from the wise men. So verse 25, they bring Jesus to the temple. They bring him as part of, of the Jewish custom of being the firstborn to be um, redeemed. All right, Verse 25, and there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit. Notice how often Luke emphasizes this man was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was devout and righteous. All right? And he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to carry for him the custom of the law, he took him into his arms and blessed him. Now, Ellen White does this interesting thing of of, uh, contrasting the spiritual uh, uh, blessing of Simeon versus the empty blessing that the priests probably had to offer. Because it wouldn't be much longer from here that the priests are going to try to destroy Jesus, right? So here in this moment, God does a really wonderful thing of bringing in this spiritually devout person to recognize that the Savior was in their midst. And he pronounces this blessing in verse 29. Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and glory of all your people, Israel. And so you have this dramatic moment I mean, this was done in public. It wasn't pulled aside. You almost, if you read the the story, it almost sounds like he kind of kidnaps Jesus, right? It says that that they, you know, Mary and Joseph uh, brought Jesus in and he took them in, took the child in his arms, all right? Um, And and and, and it says that uh, his father and mother were amazed by these things being said about him. And you just have this amazing moment. I mean, can you imagine coming into church with your little infant and having uh, 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 George here just grab that child and say, this child is for the salvation of the Gentiles? You know, you would be like, oh, that's interesting. My, okay. But then another thing happens, and uh, uh, we're going to come down to verse 36. There was a prophetess, Anna, 
the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She's advanced in years, lived with her husband seven years after marriage, and then as a widow to the age of 84. She's probably much older even than 84. By the ancient world standards, she is very old. Very old. Okay? And, it, and, and by the way, Luke gives us this detail on purpose. He wants you to know that this was a very senior member of this community. Okay? She never left the temple, verse 37 says, serving night and day with fastings and prayers. And at that very moment, she came, came up and began giving thanks to God and continued to speak of him to all who are looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. So, again, I know you're aware of this story, but just keep, log this away for just a second. This moment in the life of Jesus where he's brought as a baby and these two individuals recognize him as the Messiah. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, they lift him up and they honor him and they bless him. It's a powerful moment, right? Well, continuing on in Luke 2, I just want to look briefly, I'm going to pair these two stories together, with the story of Jesus in Jerusalem, okay? And then I'll share some thoughts, okay? And we're going to go ahead, you, you, you're aware of the story. It's at the time of the Passover. Jesus is 12 years old, it's just a few verses down from where we were in Luke chapter 2. It's at the time of the Passover, keep that in mind. And they had gone according to the custom, the family, to, to worship there in Jerusalem, um, and as they're returning home, verse 44 says that they assumed that Jesus was in the caravan along with their relatives and acquaintances. And then verse 45, when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem looking for him. And again, we could talk about this all day. Can you imagine losing the, baby, or losing the child Jesus? Would you feel a little bit stressed at that point? Lord, you've given me, you know, this Messiah, and my goodness, he could be laying in the ditch, in, you know, in, in Jerusalem. I mean, that must have been an intense uh, time. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem looking for him. Then after three days, three days, um, I, I, you know, we've had times when our kids have been missing for a few hours, and that felt like torture. Three days. They found him in the temple. Now, now notice this. Jesus is there at the temple. He's sitting in the midst of the teachers. Listen, he's both listening and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. So you see these two things are parallel. He was listening and asking questions, but they were amazed at his understanding and his answers. But when they saw him, they were astonished. His mother said, son, why have you treated us this way? Your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. And he said, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? Or some of your Bibles say about my father's business. Now again, Amazing to think about this story of this 12-year-old Jesus who, again, at the age of 12, there's so much going on uh, in, in each young person's life. All these different emotions, all these different growth things happening. And here Jesus is in Jerusalem and he goes to the temple and he's, he's teaching and they're amazed at his teaching. Now this is, again, this is the time of the Passover. Do you think Jesus was understanding that he was the Passover at the age of 12? I'm wondering if this realization was starting to come on him even at that tender age. Wouldn't it have been amazing to be there at that moment when Jesus was at the temple at the age of 12? Would you want to miss an opportunity to see Jesus? I have a friend um, at the seminary. He's a pastor. He's in the Greater New York Conference. Um, I think he still is on Long Island um, somewhere. His name is Nalon Samuel. But I remember um, at the seminary when we would talk, and each of us had been an intern pastor, done you know a little bit of pastoring. And when he first came out of Oakwood College, um, uh, one of his first church assignments was in uh, Queens, Queens, New York, and it was a large church. And being a young pastor, he was kind of given a, an assignment on Sabbath, and that was to answer the phones. Again, this was a large church, large staff, a lot of things going on. There's a bus ministry, and there'd be other things happening. And so his duty on Sabbath, this is kind of pre the ubiquitous cell phone era, he would answer the phone. And there'd be all kinds of uh, phone calls that would come in about, you know, hey, is the bus service running today? Um, you know, is there any special speaker today? And he would answer the phones. And, and he, would, he told me once, he said, you know, I got so tired of people asking, is anyone special going to be at church today? He said, I finally started answering, just Jesus. Just Jesus. No, no, pastor, you know what I mean. Is some dignitary going to be there? Do we have some special uh, professor that's going to be there? Someone that's going to be there? Well, maybe, but Jesus is going to be there. 
you know, kind of a passive aggressive thing. I, I, I wonder if he got in trouble for that. Um, but, you know, there's kind of that attitude. When, you never want to miss an opportunity when Jesus comes, right? When Jesus comes to church, do you want to be there? Did you know every time a child comes to this church, Jesus is present? Because the Bible says, to, um, uh, whatever you've done, even to the least of these, you've done unto me. Every time there is someone young and growing in their faith, Jesus is here working in their hearts. I have a vivid memory at the age of nine giving my heart to Jesus. When I was nine years old, I was in a, a children's church program, actually. Uh, our church that we went to every Sunday morning, they had an option for kids to go to children's church. And uh, I remember nine years old, the leader of that program, her name was Pansy Rice. And she made an invitation. She said, is there anyone here who wants to give their heart to Jesus? And I have a vivid memory of both the moment and the emotions I went through as I began to think in my heart about all that I've been learning growing up. In all the VBS programs I've been to, all the Sunday school programs, all the children's church programs, and I remember this desire warming up in my heart. Yes, I want that. And I remember nine years old putting my hand up. Yes, Mrs. Rice, I want to give my heart to Jesus. You know, and she said, well, come up for And there were a couple other kids. And um, uh, it was a beautiful moment in my my memory. As a matter of fact, I would say my heart belongs to Jesus today in large part because of Pansy Rice. And I just killed this again, guys. And it wasn't just Pansy Rice. There was Louise Anderson. There was Darlene Malvaney. There was Mark Reeves. How many of you, and I think I asked this last week, how many of you here today, oh, there was her picture. Oh, go back one. There she is. This sadly is from her um, obituary. She died five years ago in 2016. But that's exactly what I remember her looking like. She was in her, her uh, maybe uh, mid-50s, early 60s. I, I'm not exactly sure. Um, but Pansy Rice, every single Sunday, Pansy Rice was working in children's ministries. And I asked this last week. How many of you remember, as a child, a particular moment where you also gave your heart to Jesus? Maybe it was a VBS. Maybe it was a Sabbath school Sunday. No, no, come on, put your hands up. Don't, don't be sheepish about it. Okay? A good number of you, it was in a children's program. Now, again, there are many other factors that go into that. Um, I mean, it's never just one person um, that God uses, but sometimes in a very significant way, God uses a single person to make a difference in someone's life. Now, a story from when I was 12. Oh, my goodness, is that the time? All right, when I was 12, <laughs> um, I kind of had a rough moment. I was just moving into junior high school. Um, I was being bullied. Um, I was uh, being robbed from in school. I was not a happy camper. Uh, I just joined the youth program in, at, at our church. Again, uh, we were in, in a different church at that time. It was not a Seventh-day Adventist church. And um, I just was at a, a kind of a crisis point in my spiritual life. And the church was in between youth pastors at the time, and so someone volunteered to fill in that gap. And it was a woman by the name of Margaret Tomey. Now, Margaret Tomey was not a great leader. She was not an exceptional preacher, but she had a, just that kind, compassionate, genuine heart that you could talk to, and you knew that she loved you. You knew that she cared for you. And I have retained my faith and continue to have confidence in Jesus for a large part because Margaret Tomey helped me weather a difficult point in my life when I was 12 years old. Again, how many of you can remember growing up in, in a youth program or as you got older, someone making a significant contribution in your life as part of the work of the church? Raise your hand. We're going to go to a couple more stories. Oh, the next picture. This was the church I grew up in. This is the Central Assembly of God Church, Pentecostal Church. This is an old picture. This is even in the 70s, long before I went there. I just happened to find it when I Googled it. Uh, that is actually a steeple with the bell tower. And um, I used to sneak into that bell tower and ring those bells <laughs> and then get in big trouble. But uh, it was worth it. <laughs> Luke chapter 4, 
another story of Jesus, and I know you're familiar with it. Beginning in verse 16, it says, He came to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. He opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he's appointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the release of the captives, the recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. He closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, sat down, and the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. I would not want to have missed that service when Jesus came to that church in Nazareth. I would not want to be on the receiving end of someone saying, you you missed services this weekend. You won't believe it. This guy came, and he claimed to be the Messiah. Every single time we gather, we proclaim the word of God, and Jesus Christ is present every time we gather here. And what we do and how we serve and how we love and how we share and how we support one another emphasizes the love of God to everyone who comes here. The last story, Luke chapter 6, beginning in verse 6, the story of the man with the withered hand. Again, Luke has this way of really picking on these stories that seem to weave a theme together. This is the first of three stories of Jesus healing on the Sabbath. Okay, Jesus healing on the Sabbath. And this is the way this story unfolds. On another Sabbath, Luke 6, 6. On another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And there was a man there whose right hand was withered. Maybe by disease, maybe a birth defect, maybe he had an injury. It doesn't, we just, it, there, he had a problem with it. A withered, probably unusable hand. The scribes and the Pharisees were watching him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might find reason to accuse him. Imagine the religious leadership organizing this event so that they could accuse someone and kill him. Isn't that a lovely Sabbath? I wonder what they answered when people came to him and said, Hey, Mr. Pharisee, happy Sabbath. I wonder what they said. (laughs) Yes, this is a happy Sabbath as I planned and plot the murder of someone I don't like. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's crazy. Boy, we could talk about these stories. But notice this. and I, They're trying to find reason to accuse him. But verse 8, Jesus knew what they were thinking. Now notice what he does. He said to the man with the withered hand, get up and come forward. He doesn't do this off on the side. Hey, shh, come on. Right, let's, let's get, let's, I'll take care of you over here. Don't let anyone see. Right? Jesus knows their thoughts. He knows what's going on. He says, hey, uh, uh, come on up here. I want you to stand right here. Now notice this part. And he got up and came forward, and Jesus asked and said to them, I ask you, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to destroy it? And looking around at them all. I want you to picture in your mind, Jesus, look. (laughs) You know, he was kind of a passive-aggressive guy at times. What do you think the look of Jesus was in this moment? It says he looked at them all. The man with the withered hand is here. And it says, and looking at them all, what is right to do on the Sabbath? To destroy life or save it? Is it good to do good on the Sabbath or to do evil? And then he says, stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored. But they were filled with rage and they discussed together what they might do to Jesus. In this moment, Jesus uses this as an illustration to show that not only just what the, 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 uh, uh, the directness of the story that is fine to heal on the Sabbath, to restore life. This is the power of God. He wants to save. He wants to heal. He wants to redeem. But also in that moment, when he said to that man, stretch out your hand, That when he did that by an act of faith and it was healed, it was a statement to us all. No matter how weak your hand is, no matter how fragile your situation is, no matter how limited you think you are, when you stretch out your hand at the command of God to do good for him, your hand is strengthened. Your life is restored. Your abilities are enhanced. The Spirit comes upon you, and you are able to faithfully perform the work that God has given you. 
It wasn't just for healing's sake that God gave this man the restoration of his hand, but it's so that he could put his hand to the plow. It's so that he could do with all of his might the work of God. When I was 19 years old, and I've shared just brief tidbits of our journey into Adventism, I had a coworker, a friend, who was a Seventh-day Adventist, and he knew I was a Christian. And just out of his, his love for the faith, his love for understanding Jesus, he began to open up a conversation with me. It was not a, uh, a, 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 a condemning thing. It was not a Bible-thumping thing. He just said, let's talk about Jesus sometimes. Is it okay to talk about Jesus? Sure. Well, how about prophecy? You inter- yeah, let's talk about prophecy. Let's see what the Bible has to say. Let's learn together. And because of that, Ron Reeves helped lead my family into a greater understanding of who Jesus is. I am a Seventh-day Adventist today because Ron Reeves stretched out his hand to us and gave us an opportunity to know Jesus in ways I'd never seen before because he was willing to be a servant of Jesus Christ. And then the last one, just about a year later, we got to meet Rick Sloop. He was an elder in the church in Yakima, yeah, Central Washington. That's the 35th Avenue Church, uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church. And in, in a similar way, Rick Sloop became a mentor. He became someone who believed in us. He blessed us. He, he helped us understand things. He invited us into his home, and he led us into a greater understanding of what our calling and my calling was. And I could tell you, Almost, verb, not verbatim, but I can tell you, let's see, that's south, right? I was standing this way. <laughs> I was standing north, looking out of the windows of our house when I was on the phone with Rick, when Rick said, Dave, I think you should be a pastor. I, I just, I remember it as though it happened today. Rick believed in us. Rick was willing to bless us. And I am a Seventh-day Adventist pastor today because someone invested in my life. And I could go on through more and more details how these people and many others, now there were pastors, there were clergy, there were professionals along the way. Many other people, no story has a singular line. There's always these weaves. But it's a beautiful thing, friends, when people understand that God has given them an opportunity to bless someone else. And every time we come together is an opportunity to see Jesus. Every time we gather, the Lord is present. And everything that we do in the church, even little things that seem insignificant, God sees them as opportunities to open up a beautiful new understanding and hope. That's what the church is. That's what the hope of the church is. You know, in Revelation, and this is, this is it, this is the end. Right before the Laodicean church, this is in the, the, the third uh, chapter of Revelation, the, the, church to, uh, the letter to the church to Philadelphia. It ends this way. And I just, as I was praying and and putting my thoughts together, I thought this was a, a fitting way to conclude. It says, he who overcomes, again, this is right before Laodicea. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. I will establish him as a key part of the foundation and the construction and the success of the ministry of the temple. And he will not go out from it anymore. He will be established. And I'll write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. And he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. If we allow God to make us that pillar in his work in the last days, then when the trials of Laodicea come, we will weather them. And they are here, right? We're in Laodicea. 
But if we're established in his church, if we're established in his mission, if we're allowing the Holy Spirit to use us for his glory, then we will be overcomers. So friends, how are you active in your church? What is God calling you to do? Is it to bless the children? Is it to teach? Is it to reach out? Is it to mentor? What talent has God given you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I know that there are so many other ways and better ways to focus and present the great privilege of being part of this movement in the last days. Father, I pray that you would take my inefficiency and my stumbling and that you would make it into a cornerstone for everyone who loves you today. God, now more than ever, if it isn't clear to us all, make it clear to us, now more than ever, do we need a strong, united church. Help us to see that in its broadest ways. Sometimes we think of that and think just in those traditional roles of, of this or that. But God, you can invigorate and you can reimagine ways that we can be effective in being that pillar in your temple. That all who come would come to know you as the merciful Savior. Challenge us today, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for coming today. Thank you for watching. And uh, again, I hope that uh, you will join us in our works and efforts here at Scottsdale Thunderbird to reach this world. God bless. Thank you.